Hello and welcome to the In Publishing podcast. My name is James Evely and I'm the editor of In Publishing. I'll be presenting the podcast from now on as Kia has moved to Pastures New. We wish her well and thank her for all the excellent podcasts she's done with us since we launched them last June, all of which are available to listen to at inpublishing.co.uk slash podcasts. Our guest this time is Ivor Eisenstadt, Managing Director of Healthcare Publisher MGP. In a wide-ranging interview, Ivor explains how his early career in the pharmaceutical industry set him up nicely for his subsequent career in publishing. In the pharmaceutical industry, uh, one has to make lots of really good decisions. You, ha- you have to you know, rely on the data. You have, to, you have to take insights from the data and you have to then apply them. And you know, for me, business is about making lots and lots of, lots of right decisions. He also has some advice for organisers of virtual exhibitions on how they can make sure exhibition stands get visited and not ignored. But I think the other thing is to give delegates really good reason to visit the stands. You need to make sure that on the stands there are, for example, the CPD certificates and brochures and reports and valued items. Ivor tells us what he misses most about not being in the office. And I, I personally, I miss walking around the office, uh, walking down to the uh, the coffee machine and being able to have uh, uh, one-to-ones with everybody within the organisation about how they're getting on, about what's going well, what's not going well, congratulating them, um, really taking the temperature of the office. And you, it's so much harder to do that online. And he gives us his views on the future of the business-to-business publishing sector. Am I excited? Yes, I think there is massive opportunity. And I, I strongly believe that the B2B publishing uh, world has a lot of the solutions and the answers to a lot of the problems that we faced um, over the, over the, the past year, but to do this, we need to attract and keep the right people, and much more besides, including the identity of his favourite all-time Tottenham Hotspur player. Spoiler alert: it wasn't the scorer of that wonderful goal in the 1981 FA Cup final. Although incidentally, that's well worth replaying on YouTube. That's all coming up after a quick word about our valued sponsors. We would like to thank our podcast sponsor, Advantage CS, a leading global provider of subscription and membership management software. Capabilities include marketing, sales, payments, and customer relationship software for publishers, membership associations, and information providers. For more information, go to advantagecs.com. Ivor Eisenstadt is Managing Director of Chesham-based B2B publisher MGP, a company he founded with his wife Rosie in 1994. Operating in the healthcare sector as they do, they've presumably had a very busy 12 months. At the PPA Independent Publisher Awards in November, MGP won the award for Independent Publishing Company of the Year. Ivor, welcome to the In Publishing podcast. Thank you. And, And of course, many congratulations. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, it was a, an absolute thrill to win the win the award. Now, what, I, I was watching at the time um, the virtual event, and when you accepted the award, um, I remember you said that um, to quote, "2020 was a year we would all like to forget, but one that publishers really should remember." What did you mean by that? Um, I I suppose we all recognise that 2020 was was a, hor- a horrific year. Um, and in many ways, obviously, it's a, a year we would wish to forget. The cost in terms of mental health and physical health, economic health to businesses and to people's lives has been immense. But as in publishing, um, we've had to make great changes to, uh, to to cope with it. And arguably, a lot of these changes were, were long overdue. Um, we've had no choice but to embrace the transition to digital first, to digital virtual events, digital solutions. We've had no choice but to embrace working from home, uh, and to examine business models that potentially maybe worked in 2019, but weren't going to work in 2020. And we mustn't forget what we've learned from the year. Many of these changes, I think, could have been, we could have introduced uh, before 2020. And it was COVID that's really made us pivot with these changes. So that we've got to ask ourselves, why did we not do so before? What prevents us from being more radical in the way we think and in, in, in driving uh, changes to our creativity and, and, and productivity. The world in, of, of publishing this year is very different to the start of, uh, uh, of um, 2020, and we've really got to learn what went well, what went less well. 
Uh, and thinking about that, what do you think um, would have inhibited publishers before? As you say, everything's accelerated. COVID put people on the spot and they had to make changes. But what, what stopped them making those changes before, do you think? I think I think a lot of it is is you you manage risk in publishing, you know, and and you have to uh, weigh up if we do, for example, if we pivot to working from home completely, um, and from our point of view, it increased our productivity. But if we do that, um, and it's not absolutely needed at the time, then what are the downside? And I, I think I think it's just fear of the unknown. It's it's balancing the risks, and so we tend to be perhaps more conservative than we otherwise need to be and then when you realize you know leap in the net will appear and 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 i think we 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 recognized for example with working from home that it could work and actually massively in, uh, improved our productivity and that's just one example i think there are a lot of others that things that we we've done that have worked that perhaps we wouldn't have done had we not been forced to do them and in terms of digital transformation which i think everyone accepts has been accelerated as a result of covid how how further down the road are we as a result of covid uh, um, considerably. Uh, I mean, if you take, um, we're, in, we're in healthcare publishing, and uh, I, I think that um, uh, our, our main clients are, are the pharmaceutical industry. And if you take the pharmaceutical industry, obviously they are uh, uh, were calling, they had large rep representative forces calling on general practitioners, for example. And they, uh, for, for obvious reasons, they stopped those calls and they pivoted to digital. Um, and as a healthcare publishing, and they're our main client. Clearly, that would have accelerated what we were doing. We're already, uh, like all other publishers, we're, we're already on a, a rapid route to digital transformation. Um, but it meant that we absolutely had to uh, prioritize the digital side. And uh, for example, if you take uh, Guidelines Live, which was a face-to-face -face event, we had to pivot to a virtual event, something we would not have done if it hadn't been for COVID, but something that went extremely well and actually improved the profitability of the venture. Excellent. And you mentioned the pharmaceutical industry. I, I believe that's where you actually started your career. You didn't start off in publishing. Um, can you talk us through your journey and how do the two industries compare? Very different, I imagine. They are. They are very different. I mean, there are a lot of similarities, but they are very different. I, I started off uh, straight from university with uh, Schwartz Pharma as a, as a sales rep um, selling up in the northeast of England. There were seven of us, uh, six experienced in me. I, I love selling. I absolutely adored it. Um, developed a lot of the skills that I've uh, uh, relied on through my career. Um, used to give two, three presentations to doctors and nurses each day. And I really enjoyed learning to uh, to not just inform, but to influence them uh, in the decisions they were taking. And I was promoted then after a couple of years to regional manager and then on to sales manager for Schwartz. My wife, we, we then moved to the northwest of England. My wife was working at ICI. Um, I was covering the whole country and ICI came in for me and that made a lot of sense in view of the, uh, the travel that, that had been involved. And so I joined ICI Pharmaceuticals, um, uh, the, in particular the Stuart Pharmaceuticals part of ICI, and was involved in a range of marketing roles, sales management. And uh, the last role I was in was in uh, international business management, looking after Italy and, and Greece. In 1990, I was headhunted. Uh, to be sales and marketing manager of a Swedish company, Cubby Vitrum. Two weeks after joining from Job for Life ICI, uh, it, it announced that they were merging with Pharmacia and uh, that they would become a top 10 global pharmaceutical company by basically merging and shaking out the cost, which of course means reducing headcount. Um, and that's what I had to do. So I merged the, the two, ended up as general manager of primary care there. Uh, we had significant challenges, uh, processed several more mergers. We're drawing a product from the market due to serious side effects, launching Nicorette Patch, which at the time was probably the, well, was the most successful over-the-counter launch sales out of pharmacy of, a, of an, over a million in the first week. Um, so great experience in the industry, absolutely loved it, um, and left Carby Pharmacy in 94 with another merger going through. I had a, a, a brother who um, was a very successful independent publisher. And uh, he seemed to be spending a lot of time either on the beach in Barbados or playing tennis, which is something I wasn't able to do. Um, well, he's doing something right or was he, doing something absolutely right. Absolutely doing something right. Um, and he was enjoying the flexibility and the rewards of being his own boss. And I thought, you know, I want some of that. Um, my wife, Rosie, was working in Amersham International and in quality control at the time, wasn't really particularly enjoying it. And we thought, let's go for it. So we set up uh, uh, Medendium, uh, stands for Medical Companion, for those that ask. Initially working... Uh, from our dining room, of course, 
Um, and uh, one day, I, I actually, I came back after a couple of months, I came out and I'd sold our first, uh, first, first ad to the industry, pharmaceutical industry. And Rosie said, sit down. And so I sat down. And of course, when you've got a small business, um, things can go horribly wrong very quickly. And I was concerned. And she said, Iva, um, I'm pregnant. And my response was, well, it's not in the business plan. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't long after that we moved out, uh, uh, not me from the home, but we moved out into offices and built a team around us. Um, in 97, we introduced guidelines and really the business has, has very much grown from there. So that's kind of my career history up until uh, 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 entering into the, the publishing world. How would I uh, compare? That, sorry, yes. Sorry, I was about to say, in terms of skill sets required, I would have thought, you know, what you what you had to, um, the skill sets you needed in the pharmaceutical industry and uh, presumably a whole set of different skill sets in publishing. W was that yes. daunting or did you feel your brother was giving you, who did you lean on for advice in those days? Yeah, uh, yeah, good question. I mean, I, I, Mark and his partner, Tony, business partner, Tony, were very supportive when we started, which was fantastic. Um, we started with a directory and they had their own directory, which I'd actually given them a little bit of consultancy on. Um, and uh, as a result, I think we learned a lot from from them um, and uh, by introducing Medenium as a as a directory, uh, when we then introduced guidelines, which is a, a, a handbook of clinical guideline summaries, there were a lot of similarities in the in the, the, the publication uh, the publishing techniques. Um, I mean, a lot of the skills you pick up as you go through through the various jobs that you do. Uh, for example, um, uh, in in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, one has to make lots of really uh, a good decisions. You ha you have to you know, rely on the data. You have to you have to take insights from the data, and you have to then apply them. And you know, for me, business is about making lots and lots of of lots of right decisions. Um, and I think if you do that in any walk of life, um, you're going to succeed. I have to say, before we set the business up, my my wife Rosie was very much uh, as I mentioned, research, quality control, and I was much more kind of outward marketing sales and we always said whatever the business was if we if we combined those skills we could probably be successful irrespective of the sector but we chose well, publishing like, sorry yeah we chose publishing well it sounds like an excellent excellent team and publishing was your choice indeed indeed mm. yes now you you operate in the healthcare sector as we've said and your flagship brand is um called guidelines um it's obviously a highly competitive sector lots of publishers in it um what makes guidelines different from the other other offerings out there yeah um well as a company mgp we, we we're focused fully on promoting best practice in healthcare um and we've got a range of multi-platform titles and projects focused around the, the guidelines agenda so we've got guidelines which is a directory of clinical guidelines summaries as i mentioned but we've also got guidelines in practice which is all about what you do with the guidelines guidelines for pharmacy guidelines for nurses obviously focused the guidance for the particular audiences um and in the uh, independent GP medical research survey uh, last year, guidelines, as consistently has been the case, guidelines came out as the most useful information source. Um, that's guidelines in terms of clinical guidelines generally. 94% of GPs stand up that saying that they are very or quite useful. Um, and obviously our titles are uniquely entirely focused on best practice and guidelines. It's must read information. So in effect, we've got the audiences that recognize and trust the guidelines brands that deliver the need to know information that, 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 that they have to have. Um, from the same survey, they actually found that guidelines, the publication is one of the most referred to GP publications. 64% of GPs referred to it in the previous 12 months, every issue, a quarter of a million GP referrals. Um, and so I suppose what's unique is that we've got unique titles, uniquely focused on the guidance agenda. We've got a unique audience that relies on that information. And we also have a range of, of unique projects to actually make that happen. Um, from the client's perspective, particularly the pharmaceutical industry, in effect, if a guideline is developed by a professional body, independent of that particular company, but if it positions a company's product well, then it's in the interest of the company to support projects that can change clinical practice in, in, in line with the guidance. But that's also in the interest, of course, of healthcare professionals. And most importantly, it's in the interest of patients. And we are uniquely placed to, to support that agenda. And when you started the, the brand, you obviously spotted a gap in the market. Nobody else was doing, doing this um, already. 
That's right. In fact, when we brought guidelines out, it, it predated NICE by uh, o- over two years. All um, right. Yes. Uh, yeah, and, and in fact, um, uh, guide, guidelines filled a niche that we know at the time the Department of Health were very keen to be, full, uh, to be filled. Um, they wanted to see guidelines in all the major disease areas, uh, but they were unable uh, to because they didn't really know what made a good guideline. So they were really unable to uh, to deliver that uh, uh, rapidly. But um, we were we were able to do so by um, contacting the professional bodies, working with them in summarizing the guidelines, but not saying this was necessarily a good guideline or a bad guideline. We weren't judgmental. What we were purely doing is saying this is the guideline. This has been produced by the British Association of whatever. And, and making and letting healthcare professionals then make their own mind up about the validity or otherwise of that particular guideline. So, so presumably your editorial teams are made up of um, medical experts, I would guess. That's right. I mean, the, uh, yeah, we have an, uh, an awful lot of uh, science graduates, of course, in, within the company and, 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 and uh, pharmacists and the like, yes. And in terms of business models, what, what, what were the revenue streams? And uh, did it start in, in one area and has it evolved over time to exploit, I, exploit might be the wrong word, but take advantage of other revenue streams? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, the business model in the 90s, to be honest, was, was a fairly typical one, which was it was a controlled circulation, print journals funded by advertising. And, you know, it worked very well. But of course, the advertising market, print advertising market since has, has fallen away quite badly. Um, uh, but at the time, the model worked extremely well. But over time, we then introduced websites. Uh, we introduced then a range of projects to help change behavior in line with the guidance and support and educate healthcare professionals in line with the clinical guidance and best practice. So we introduced um, uh, things like checklists and decision guides and webinars, algorithms, roundtable discussions, resource centers, email newsletters, etc. And I suppose really what we do is only limited by our imagination and is, is only limited by the codes of practice that are very um, uh, restrictive, but, uh, but rightly so, that, the, that, that, that mean that the pharmaceutical industry uh, are controlled in what they can and what they, what they can't support. But we now work with over 70 professional bodies in summarizing guidance. We work with uh, last year, 75 pharmaceutical companies uh, and two thirds of our revenue. So having been 100% advertising, two thirds of our revenue comes from the, the projects that I mentioned multi-platform projects and, and the future growth is going to come from the development of these projects but also expansion of things like the conference guidelines live and the new titles so for example guidelines in pharmacy is just over a year old uh, it took seven percent of the print pharmacy ad market in its first full year but it's got enormous potential to add on projects and events in line with the other titles um, uh, and to what extent are your revenues um, still commercial based you know from from the pharmaceutical industry or or reader revenues the, the vast majority, virtually all of our revenue comes from from uh, advertising and sponsorship. Um, we are not a strong company when it comes to uh, subscriptions. It's not really in our, our DNA. Um, we are getting an, an increase in terms of revenues from, for example, events. And we are looking at areas such as premium content. But most of our revenue will come from um, from sponsorship and from advertising rather than from reader revenues as such. OK, but is that something you're thinking of developing? Because I noticed on your on your website, there were options to to both register and to subscribe. Is that putting your, you know, dipping your toe in the water, so to speak? That's right. In fact, our, our um, uh, subscription revenue last year dramatically increased, but it's still minor compared to the rest of our revenue. But it is something we want to increase. Um, and I, I think I think the key here is is to to ensure that we have a, a an engaged audience. Um and the print publications are free circulation, but we do sell copies of, of the, the, the hard copy as well. But to make sure we have an engaged audience for our sponsors and our advertisers. But over time to add um, premium products that we can then sell. So add, adding reports and adding um, other information that um, will allow us to generate uh, repeat reader revenues. OK. Um, excellent. And the going back to the PPA uh, award for a second, the judges praised you for the success you'd had in transforming your annual guidelines live event from free to paid for. Um, what, what, what pushed you down that road and what made you think that attendees who had presumably come along for free previously might be persuaded to, um, to pay for it? Well, we'd, we'd, we'd carried out a number of um, uh, events, uh, one, single day events, and they'd been free to attend and they'd had, they'd had a good delegate registrations, um, but the attrition between 
the the numbers signing up to attend and those actually attending was, was quite high. Um, and when we decided that we would then uh, move to a two day event at Olympia, we wanted to be absolutely sure that we could get an attendance there. We would receive, have an attendance there that was was close to but not above capacity. Um, what we didn't want was a high attrition rate. Um, and so we looked at potentially charging. Um, so we researched the charging model. We found a, a sweet spot which wouldn't discourage registration, but would encourage attendance. Um, and we then heavily promoted the event, but we promoted it at a full typical industry rate and offered significant uh, bursaries, discounts to the sweet spot, spot price for our registered website users, which obviously gave them value added, but also meant that we got a, a really good turn up, uh, really good um, uh, uh, registrations, but also significantly reduced the the the, uh, the attrition rate, the dropout rate before for the event. So in the end, we ended up with a record attendance, which was pretty close on uh, capacity and generated significant additional revenue. Um, so it, yeah, it worked really well. Um, I think the key there is to uh, is to do the research and find the sweet spot. Well, that and that sweet spot is an interesting concept. Uh, is that something you 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 saw other people doing, or is that something you all brainstormed and came up between yourself? Um, yeah, no, it was something we 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 we, we well, brainstormed. We we, we 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 looked at the various options, and we wanted to try and uh, ensure that, uh, bearing in mind that our motive wasn't necessarily to generate revenue, our motive was to be able to predict the numbers so we got as close to the capacity as possible. We were able, as a result of that, to to to, to consider what sort of research was required and then act upon the information we we, we received. So what would you say were the key elements of, you know, for another publisher, let's say, wanting to switch a, a free event to a paid for event? You know, what would be some do's and don'ts? You, What kind of advice would you give them? So when 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 switching from a um, a, a free to a, a paid for event, I, I, I would say um, uh, do the research, find the sweet spot, um, think about what you can do to um, add value, to encourage them to pivot from what perceive they perceived previously as a free event to then having to pay. Um, but I also think it's worth giving them an encouragement. And I have to say that the bursary worked extremely well. I think uh, it, 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 it made sure that our registered users uh, felt they were being valued. Um, and our previous attendees who had attended for free um, were um, were, were, were keen and did were happy to pay, but I think you you have to explain why you're charging, what you're charging for, and uh, make it make it worthwhile and give value added. Excellent. And are your other events? Because I don't think Guidelines Live is your only event. Are you using this, a similar strategy on your other other events? Not necessarily. No, not not really. Because to to be honest, the the, the big growth in our events over the past uh, twelve months has been in in sponsored webinars. Um, our, our, our primary model is the sponsorship model. Um, the pharmaceutical industry uh, are uh, keen to um, support clinical guidance, which is which positions their products well. They are unable to do so through their their sales forces in quite the same way as they had in the past. And one of the solutions that we can help them with, obviously, is is, is the webinars. And webinar, webinars have been extremely successful. Um, and we we've made them free to to attend because the primary model is through sponsorship of the industry. And are you now doing more webinars since COVID started than you were before? Oh, uh, tenfold. Yeah. All right. Wow. So so when COVID struck about a year ago now, um, you successfully turned guidelines live into a virtual event, as we discussed. Um, you know, what were your key learnings from that first foray into virtual events? Um, so. We, we knew we knew we knew we had to uh, we had to pivot. We 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 obviously we, we could have cancelled the event completely. We had a very successful live event. The the aim in 2020 was to then grow particularly the exhibition side. We we had a full complement of sponsors lined up and then COVID struck and we, we thought, OK, what are we going to do here? And the option was to look at virtual. Um, what we wanted to do was we'd, we'd, we'd heard that a number of um, events had gone badly wrong. And we didn't want to put on an event that was going to go wrong because apart from anything else, the sponsors we had lined up are also our long-term partners in terms of advertising and project support. 
So our priority was really keeping our sponsors, um, but we only really wanted to put on a virtual event if we could have a great experience. Um, so we, I, we initially, we identified a number of uh, virtual conference uh, uh, providers, platform providers. Um, we focused on the area that we wanted to most uh, deliver on, which was the, the sponsored sessions. Um, and what we got was actually a tremendous provider. We had a, a really well-organized event, and obviously a large part of that is down to the MGP crew, but we had a really well-organized event. It looked great. Um, we had a record attendance. We had fantastic engagement, great feedback, and all at a, 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 at a fraction of the cost of a face-to-face -face event. So it went really, really well. And I suppose to answer your question about lessons, Firstly, I would say choose the right platform, don't skimp. Um, uh, it, it's going to cost less than a face-to-face -face equivalent and it, it's not worth compromising on. Secondly, uh, virtual conferences are, are fantastic for sponsored sessions. So uh, really, really go out and make sure that you have, uh, have a, 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 a serious uh, um, uh, focus on sponsored sessions. Um, convincing exhibitors is harder than for face-to-face -face events. It's seen as new and high risk. And certainly when we approach the exhibitors to pivot from face-to-face -to, -face to, um, to virtual, uh, there was quite a bit of reluctance. Um, some had had bad experiences. Um, so we looked at risk share models and that's what really allowed us to get the exhibitors on board. And I think you need to think about that because at the end of the day, it is, a, a, it is initially a risk if they haven't had a good experience or they haven't had any experience of, of virtual events. But I think the other thing is to give delegates really good reason to visit the stands. You need to make sure that on the stands there are, for example, the CPD certificates and brochures and reports and valued items. And then one needs to promote these throughout the event, before the event, throughout the event, to make sure that the delegates do visit and remember to visit the exhibition stands. Other lessons, um, I think it's really important that speakers are well briefed. Uh, unlike face-to-face -face events, it's not a captive audience. So uh, delegates in a face-to-face -face event, a live event, you know, they, they, they once they're in a session, they're in a session. Um, but on online, virtual, if it's a boring session and they're not enjoying it, then they may go to another session or they may just leave and go and do something else. So speakers need to be strong. Uh, the content needs to be strong. You know, the engaging slides, no lists, uh, captivating style. Um, so I think that's really important. And then the other area, of course, is try and minimize uh, risk of, technological failures and poor presentations. And what we decided to do was to pre-record the sessions, um, which gave us control over them and gave us control over the technology, um, but do live Q and A's, which kept that, that um, uh, uh, kind of a, a responsive nature and dynamic nature within the conference itself. It worked really well. And of course it also allowed us then to run those pre-recorded sessions post-event, um, and in fact, uh, to answer one of your earlier questions, we actually then sold those as, as, as premium content as well. Um, oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, so um, I, th I think there's one other thing I think is really important, and, th and that's that um, th the great thing about events is you get a lot of data, the virtual events, you get a lot of data and you can provide a lot of insight. And I think it's important to provide that insight to delegates, to sponsors and exhibitors and to report it uh, promptly because, um, I think personally, virtual events are a very powerful, very cost effective solution for delegates, for sponsors, for exhibitors. But we're still learning uh, what works, what's not working. And I think it's really incumbent upon all of us to share in those learnings so we can develop what is a very valuable potential medium. OK, excellent. I must just quickly ask you, what, what exactly is a, a risk share model? What are the dynamics of that or the, the part, constituent parts? Um, so uh, as, as, as far as risk, risk, risk share, share is concerned, then it's all about numbers. It's about uh, agreeing, for example, for a uh, number, of, number of delegates, number of interactions, and having an agreed figure and uh, maybe having a figure uh, where we um, say, OK, this, this is the basic cost. And then to achieve the KPIs, if we achieve them, we get X amount. And if we uh, uh, don't achieve them, then we, we get less. And so it it's basically means that uh, uh, the, the risk is incumbent upon both ourselves and on the, the exhibitor in terms of the, the outputs. And were exhibitors re receptive to that message? They were receptive to that message and we were able to deliver against those as well. So, so it, it, it worked well. But I think it's all about um, minimising the risk and the perception of risk to, to the exhibitor. Okay. Uh, and when COVID's behind us, and we're all counting down the days, I know, um, do you think virtual events will remain or do you think we're all just going to leap straight back into in-person events? Uh, personally, I think that virtual 
uh, virtual events are here to stay. I, I have no doubt of that. I think they have a, a fantastic place. And I mentioned about webinars, which in effect are virtual events um, and are growing very strongly. But I also think the live events have a place. So I, I think I think virtual events are great for generating audience numbers, great for generating broad reach, international reach and reach outside of the locality. Um, they're great for establishing um, uh, 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 engagement and then post event engagement. Um, and they're particularly strong for sponsored presentations. I, I think the live events are great for a captive audience. They're great for generating personal contact. Um, and obviously, they're very valuable for exhibitors. Um, what's interesting, of course, is the hybrid model. And I think getting the best of both worlds and getting the right hybrid model is the challenge. But I do I do believe, yes, online, online virtual events are here to stay, but live events will be back. Now, with your brands operating in the healthcare sector, which has obviously been particularly busy for, for obvious reasons, what has been the impact of COVID on, on, on MGP? Um, we, we're, 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 we've been fortunate. Um, COVID has it led to a, an increased need by healthcare professionals for reliable, trustworthy information, i.e. clinical guidance. In fact, there was a, a whole host of clinical guidance that was published um, as a result of COVID. In other words, how do you manage patients who have got COVID and diabetes or COVID and heart disease, for example? An absolute plethora of, of guidance and information that healthcare professional need to be aware of and, and, and relied upon us to provide it. Um, additionally, and I mentioned this earlier, the pharmaceutical industry moved away from uh, representative face-to-face -face visits for, for obvious reasons um, and pivoted very much to digital as a result. And again, we're very strong as an organization in terms of digital. Um, so we're able to provide the healthcare professional audience to, to support them in this. So um, as a result, we, we um, had an increase in audience engagement we delivered a record number of projects. We had record sales, record profits. So we're, we were one of the very fortunate ones. Um, but the other area in terms of COVID is how has it affected internally the company? Um, we, we trialed half the company um, working from home before lockdown was imposed on, on the UK. So we, we saw what was happening in Italy and France and Spain, and we, we, we modeled it. Um, and we then had half the company working in the office, half from home. And the idea is then to pick up the learnings. And that allowed us to ide identify the issues prior to us all then being having to work from home. And, and the result was a, um, a pretty smooth transition. We've been working uh, from home ever since. And the office is now a resource for those that need face-to-face uh, -face meetings or for those who, for whatever reason, are unable to work from home. Um, so um, it's been it's been a... Uh, a quite relatively smooth transition. Um, in, in terms of quantifying the benefits, I think it's actually increased our productivity, it's reduced our costs for sure, and it's reduced our staff turnover. Um, conversely, uh, I would say that we do have some concerns. Um, I think we have concerns about how some members of the team are coping. Um, we have a suspicion that we've lost some creativity, perhaps some problem solving ability and we may not pick pick up issues as rapidly as we did when we were all in the office and i i personally um i miss walking around the office uh walking down to the uh the coffee machine and being able to have uh one-to-ones uh, with everybody within the organization about how they're getting on about what's going well what's not, not going well congratulating them um really taking the temperature of the office and you, it's so much harder to do that online yes we do company information meetings and we do cross-functional meetings, departmental get-togethers and we use Teams and Slack and all the rest of it. But it's not as personal as a quick one-to-one -one by the coffee machine. Um, no, I, I can see that. I, I get the impression that in the early days during the first lockdown, everyone thought what a great thing. But as time has gone on, I, I get the feeling that people are kind of itching to get back into the office to a certain extent. Is that the feeling you get or, or not so much? I think it's mixed. I think there are certainly individuals out there that, that are, and in fact, we've got one or two that are already back in the office because they can't work from home. Um, but there are others that I think would love to spend their, 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 their life working from home. Personally, I think from our point of view, we will return to the office. Um, who knows when? Hopefully second half of this year, uh, but on a more flexible basis. I, I saw a recent survey, fascinating survey, 2,000 companies, and it suggested that 30% of companies were planning to lose their head office. And something like 50% were planning to reduce the amount of office space that they had. Uh, it also found that workers, mm -hmm. the, the plan was for workers to be into the office between one and two days a week. 
Um, and their experience in terms of the feedback is reflects, I think, what we've experienced, which is that it would save on costs, focus the team on outputs, allow recruitment uh, through a, a, for a, a, from a wider area, potentially internationally, of course, um, as a result, uh, attracting a more talented workforce, um, minimizing staff potentially leaving because by having flexible arrangements, then uh, one is less likely to lose uh, to companies who are already offering more flexible arrangements. Uh, cutting down on wasted travel time, reducing pollution, I suppose, as a result, um, and just generally offering better employee quality of life. Um, so, yeah, we're going to go back. Um, we're going to go back on a more flexible basis. We haven't specifically determined exactly what that looks like, uh, but we're working on it. We want to learn from what others are, are doing and what's working, what's not working. I think the one thing we all know is that the office will never be the same place again. Now, I've read somewhere, Ivor, I, I think an interview you did maybe with the PPA, that you place great emphasis on communications and fostering a, a no-blame company culture. Can you talk us through the thinking behind that and what it's meant for the success of MGP? Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's very important for us. Uh, let me, I, I, I was sort of thinking about this, and there's a, uh, there's a story I'd like to relate, which is uh, I was traveling with a friend of mine who works, worked at the time for a, one of the major oil companies, and um, he managed the fueling of cruise liners. And when driving, taking him to a Spurs game one day, um, uh, we, he had a call that the fleet of liners, um, cruise liners, had ground to a halt uh, because they'd supplied the wrong grade of fuel. Um, right. So I immediately said, right, I'll take you back to your office and you can sort it out. And he was calm. He said, no, 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 let's go watch the game. We've got processes in place. And basically he said, look, we tow them back to port. We'll fuel the tankers. We'll clean the tanks out. We'll refuel them. We'll send them back out there and we'll give them a lot of value added. And we'll give them such a good service, they'll never use anyone else again. And the lesson wow. was that an error for them is the best opportunity you have to show how good you are at looking after your customers. Now, I, I mean, I learned a lot from that. At MGP, we work with all the top pharmaceutical companies. We have to do a great job to ensure we get repeat project business. We have to. Errors will happen. We're all humans. Errors are going to happen. Yes, we can put place in place processes to stop them and minimize them, but there will always be some errors that will happen. Often, you know, sometimes not our fault. It could be our printers, for example. What we have to do is we have to have them flagged up quickly. We have to then put them right. We have to be able to add value at the time. And when we're all working from home, we have to trust each other. We have to trust each other to... Um, to flag up when errors uh, happened. And we have to be able to trust each other then to ensure that between us, we put it right, we add the value. But working from home means it's potentially easier to cover them up and to hide them. And obviously that's in no one's interest. So a no blame culture, accepting that errors happen, priority on addressing them, flagging them up, addressing them and overcoming them is absolutely essential. But the caveat to that is that one has to have a no tolerance policy on covering up. I can see that. Absolutely. Now, if you look over the, the next year or so and putting COVID to to one side for a minute, what, what are your goals for MGP? Where, where would you like the company to be in a few years time? So um, we're strategically focused on, on promoting best practice and we will continue to be strategically focused on promoting best practice. That, that, that's what sets us apart. That's our uniqueness. And that's why we've been successful in my view. Um, so to do that, we need to continue focusing on the existing guidelines range, the existing brands, the existing projects. Um, we, and I mentioned the webinars, for example, there are a number of initiatives that are going really well that we'll clearly focus on. We need to optimize the growth potential of guidelines live, get back to face to face as well as virtual, expand the exhibition side face to face. Um, we've got guidelines for pharmacy, as I mentioned earlier, going really well. We need to be building the digital side of that and the projects. And potentially we've got opening up of international markets. Um, but the focus, the key focus has got to be digital on our digital audiences, our digital insights and our digital offerings. Um, we had a record year in 2020. We had double digit growth and our, our, our strategic aim is to continue do double digit growth for the foreseeable future. But you know what? If you ask me personally, where would I like to be in two years time? I can tell you after the year we've had, I would like to be sunning myself on a beach in the Maldives. <laughs> well absolutely absolutely uh, but, and print what what role does print have in a few years time obviously digital has been the focus for the last year is print still important to to what you do yeah print is still important to what we do um so i mentioned earlier that we two-thirds of our revenues from projects those projects are multi-platform projects so we have the journals and, they, and we still take print advertising um but 
print print has a real value. So if a a company supports a a project, um, let's say it's implementing a a diabetes guideline, um, then we will do projects around that. But we will also uh, promote those projects in in our print journals, and we will also uh, run advertising in the print journals, which will create a um, a foundation to get the most out of, out of the projects. So for us, you know, healthcare professionals, um, we, we frequently do, do, do research. And I mentioned there's the independent uh, GPMS survey, the General Practitioner, Practitioner Medical Research Survey. And it shows consistently that print is still very popular. Um, and we know that, you know, over 50% of GPs routinely read our publications in print. So for us, print's not going away anytime soon. It's a very valuable part of the mix that we have and it's a very valuable part of how we we promote our uh, the project work that, that we do so i'm um, stepping back for a second and looking at the wider business to business publishing sector what do you see as the main challenges and opportunities um and are you excited about the outlook for the sector so um i, I think the main the main challenge is is um i suppose understanding what the role of business b2b media is in the new world the world of COVID or indeed the world of post-COVID, the world of social media, a world of fake news, the world of sensationalism. Um, I think I think we need to understand what we're about, what we're providing, why we're providing it. Um, and the opportunity is taking on that challenge, taking on the challenge of providing trustworthy, insightful, relevant, timely content in whatever form it takes, whether it's, it's print or digital or whatever form it takes um, that our audience is... Uh, uh, will want to engage with um so am i excited yes i think there is massive opportunity and i i i, I strongly believe that that the b2b publishing uh, world has a lot of the solutions and the answers to a lot of the problems that we faced um over the, over the, the past year um but to do this um we need to attract and keep the right people and you you asked earlier about you know where do we see ourselves in in two years time? Well, you know one gets asked that a lot at interview when one's interviewing people to join the company. They say where where's the company going to be in five years? Um, and I generally give the same answer, which is I don't really know because the NHS is changing, um, uh, the um, uh, publishing is changing, the publishing world is changing, the platforms that we use is changing, the pharmaceutical industry is changing, our sponsors, our clients, everything is changing. And that change is not going to get slower, it's going to carry on. And with COVID, we found that you get massive changes. So the only thing you can be sure about, the only thing is that if you've got bright, committed, adaptable people, people who are led by data insights, people who are inspired by providing audiences with great content, with great, en great engagement experiences, if you've got the right people, then the business will be doing really well. And if you haven't, if you've got people that aren't flexible, that can't change them, that, that, that are completely risk averse, then you will struggle. So I'm excited because I think B2B publishing is a, a dynamic industry. I think it attracts people that want to be, uh, want to make change happen. And I think it's a great place to be to do that. That's a very uplifting message. Um, and finally, Ivor, a, a question we ask all of our guests Um Outside of work, what do you do to relax? Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, I was thinking about this recently as well. We we are, are currently uh, building a, a new build house in in Suffolk, close to Alborough by the coast. Um, I can't say that uh, taking on the building of such a house is relaxing, but it certainly takes a lot of one's spare time. <laughs> um, it's close to the coast. It's got fabulous walks right next to an RSPB reserve, and I love bird watching. So um, it, that is that is, and we go down there whenever we can. But obviously, with COVID, that that is more limited. Additionally, I enjoy writing. I, I, I keep a daily diary. I had a novel published a few years ago. Um, Final score. It's all about a, the day in the life of a sports addict. Um, and uh, uh, you probably gathered it's semi autobiographical. I love going to watch whether it's rugby or cricket or whatever the sport, particularly uh, football. I'm a Spurs season ticket holder. I have been. For many many years um and when i need to wind down off the frustrations of watching spurs and i think all fellow spurs fans will know what i'm talking about there then if i want to wind down and relax from that then we we certainly prior to covid anyway we'd go to the berkhamsted rex which is our local cinema and arguably the finest cinema in the universe um, but overall though how do we how do i relax and particularly during the time of covid it's spending time of course with rosie my wife with our three 
wonderful children, our extended family, our friends, and Laura, who is our one-year-old granddaughter who has brought enormous joy into all of our lives throughout the time of COVID. Fantastic. I'm going to throw in one final one because mm. I know everyone loves football. Well, no, not everyone at all. <laughs> Quite a few do. I actually support Leeds United, which is an interesting one. Oh, yeah. I've ever actually been to Leeds, but um, that's yeah. that's a long story. But um, I must ask you, who, who, you know, in all the years you've been following Spurs, um, who is your favourite ever Spurs players or, or, or who are your top three or four? OK, so over the years, we've been very lucky at Spurs. We've had some fantastic players. And, and obviously, one would, one would pull out players such as uh, Glenn Hoddle and Gaza and Chris Waddle and Gareth Bale um, and, of course, Harry Kane, all fantastic players. But I'd probably go back a bit earlier. I, I went to my first game. Uh, Dad took me when I was just uh, uh, six years old. Um, and there was a player then who, for the next 10 years, I loved to watch, and that was Jimmy Green. There was another player, actually. Pat Jennings was amazing, probably the best goalkeeper we've ever had. Uh, probably playing in, in, in this country. But anyway, um, uh, I would say Jimmy Greaves. I was, he was fabulous. He was just so exciting whenever he got the ball. I saw him score so many wonderful goals um, against Leeds in particular, but, but generally <laughs> um, he was a wonderful player. Um, and probably I've got a picture, a signed picture of him on my wall. And uh, I look at that from reg on a regular basis. And the other thing I look at is uh, watching uh, Ricky Villa, on my 25th birthday, scored the winning goal in the FA Cup final by rounding three Manchester City players. If only you can do that in the League Cup final in a, a month's time. Well, I, funny enough, I'm going to age myself as well. I remember that goal very well. Manchester <laughs> City, wasn't it? Manchester City, indeed, yes. Fantastic. Uh, Iva, happy memories. Um, Iva Eisenstadt, thank you very much for being our guest on the In Publishing podcast. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. We would like to thank Advantage CS again for sponsoring this podcast. Advantage CS has been developing subscription management solutions for the information industry since 1979. The comprehensive functionality, adaptability and scalability of its software helps leading publishers around the world manage their businesses more effectively. Find out more at AdvantageCS.com. Thank you to Ivor for a fascinating chat. I particularly liked the simplicity of his formula for business success. Make lots of good decisions based on the analysis and application of data. Surely we can all manage that, can't we? If you'd like to find out more about MGP, then go to mgp.co.uk. If you fancy checking out Ivor's 2017 book, Final Score, A Day and the Life of a Sports Addict, then that's available to buy on Amazon. You can find out more about us at our website inpublishing.co.uk where you can also sign up for our free weekly newsletter, InPub Weekly. Just click on the register link. Thank you for listening and do join me in two weeks' time for another In Publishing podcast. <laughs>